let's now talk about this topic that is thermodynamic of reduction process thermodynamic principles involved in the reduction process in metallurgy i told you uh, metallurgical operation involves reduction as one of the most important steps why because metals in their compounds uh, they exhibit positive oxidation state so if you want to recover metal from its compound you need to reduce it so reduction is an important step involved in the metallurgical operation so we are now going to talk about thermodynamics involved in the reduction process of metal oxides we know uh, for a spontaneous process for a spontaneous process delta g must be negative any process whose delta g is negative will be a spontaneous process and we know that delta g is given by this is gibbs helmholtz equation delta g equals to delta h minus t delta s this is gibbs helmholtz equation which gives relationship between these thermodynamic parameters now what is delta g delta g is change in free energy what is delta h delta h is change in enthalpy of in the process change in enthalpy and then delta s is change in entropy of the system and t is absolute temperature this is how they are related delta g is equal to delta h mi minus t delta s and we know that for a process to be spontaneous delta g must be negative now uh, for delta g to be negative the delta h of the process should be negative delta s should be positive this is the most preferred condition change in entropy should be positive and change in enthalpy must be negative that means the reaction should be exothermic and it should involve increase in entropy of the system then it is a guaranteed spontaneous process suppose for a process if delta h is negative and delta s is also negative it means that this tends to make the delta g negative and this tends to make the delta g positive so if such a process is spontaneous then it is said to be driven by enthalpy there are processes which are driven by entropy there are processes which are driven by enthalpy there can be a process which is driven by both entropy as well as enthalpy if uh, delta h is negative delta s is positive then the sign of delta g will be largely decided on the basis of temperature by changing temperature it is possible to make delta g negative or less negative or maybe positive once it becomes positive then the process becomes uh, non spontaneous the forward process becomes non spontaneous the reverse process will take place we are going to apply this to uh, metal oxide formation and try to find out uh, try to look at the various applications of it uh, consider this reaction metal solid plus oxygen gas you get metal oxide this is also a solid so for this process delta s is negative the reason is you are consuming a gas and transforming it into a solid that means you are going from a disordered state to an ordered state so there is a decrease in the disorderness of the system in the forward reaction so for the forward reaction delta s is negative you know very well that the entropy of solid will be less than that of liquid and that of liquid is less than gas okay now what about delta h delta h for this process is generally negative that means metal oxide formation from metal and oxygen is generally an exothermic process so this will clearly tell us that 
this reaction is favored by enthalpy it is being suppressed by entropy now it is possible to change the direction of this reaction by changing temperature if you increase temperature then the process will go in the backward direction metal oxide will be reduced to metal and if you decrease the temperature this type of reaction will take place metal reacts with oxygen to give metal oxide so the direction of this reaction will be largely dependent on temperature because the process is driven by this forward reaction is driven by enthalpy whereas the backward reaction is driven by entropy in such cases the direction of reaction is decided on the basis of temperature high temperature will favor backward reaction high temperature will favor backward reaction so we can say theoretically we can say any metal oxide when it is heated it can to a sufficiently high temperature when it is heated it can uh, get reduced on its own it will decompose to give metal it is possible to uh, decompose any metal oxide if sufficiently high temperature is used but this is not always economical some metal oxides which are not that very stable can be reduced in this way but thermally stable oxides cannot be uh, it is not advantageous to reduce them in this manner there is a solution we are going to discuss under ellingham diagram which gives relationship between delta g and temperature ellingham diagram uh, under thermodynamics in metallurgy ellingham diagram this is a graph actually which shows variation of delta g formation standard free energy of formation against temperature for this reaction metal to metal oxide reaction formation of metal oxide f represents formation of metal oxide and you can see for all the metals the graph uh, has positive slope graph is moving up Ex forget about carbon for metals it is going up that means uh, this is the point uh, where uh, the delta g becomes zero and beyond this it becomes positive that means uh, once a temperature is reached to a level where delta g becomes positive then the compound will decompose and backward reaction takes place so every metal it is tending upwards so at a sufficiently high temperature that will decompose the metal oxide will decompose to generate metal i told you in the previous section we said that any metal oxide can be decomposed to metal if sufficiently high temperature is used so that's the reason why you find this graph the lines going upwards fine now sometimes you observe change in slope of the line it is because of change in the physical state of substance if it goes from solid to liquid state obviously liquids have more entropy than uh, solids and the entropy change with increase in temperature also will be higher so that's why you see changes in the slope of the line you can see that metals like silver and mercury uh, they are uh, in the top positions and they decompose very easily uh, this is the temperature corresponding to this point the temperature where uh, you know silver oxide decomposes at some relatively higher temperature mercuric oxide decomposes to give mercury on its own so it is advantageous to decompose silver oxide and mercuric oxide just by heating without using any reducing agent but for other things we need to use reducing agent now uh, the line for nickel is above iron that means the delta g for the formation of iron is relatively more negative than the delta g formation of nickel that means if iron and nickel both are present if you pass oxygen fe will prefer forming oxide rather than nickel so fe has more tendency to form oxide than nickel so for active metals you find active metals with a higher negative delta at, at the bottom and less active metals at the top you find more active metals in the bottom and less active metals on the top and any metal which is at the top position has less tendency to react with oxygen than any metal which is present below it or you can put it in this way a metal can reduce another metal oxide if it is present below it in the ellingham diagram i have aluminum metal and ferric oxide if i mix these two and heat then what happens you know aluminum becomes aluminum oxide and fe2o3 will become fe the reason is aluminum is below fe in the ellingham diagram that means uh, aluminum oxide formation has more negative delta g value than ferric oxide 
So it becomes a coupled reaction. Decomposition of ferric oxide is non-spontaneous at a low temperature. Formation of aluminum oxide is spontaneous at the same temperature. So if you mix these two, the spontaneous process which has more negative delta G value will make the non-spontaneous process become spontaneous. It is a case of coupled reaction. So one uh, very important thing you should know is a metal can reduce other metal oxide if it is present below it in the Ellingham diagram because the delta G for formation of its oxide will be more negative than the metal which is present above it in the Ellingham diagram. So this diagram will help you what reducing agent can do a particular type of job. Look at these two cases. This is for aluminum, this is for magnesium. So you can clearly say that the tendency for magnesium to form magnesium oxide is more, it has more negative value of delta G than uh, aluminum becoming aluminum oxide. But this is up to a particular temperature, somewhere around 1700 degrees Celsius. And beyond this temperature, aluminum has more tendency to form oxide than magnesium. Or I can put it like this, magnesium can reduce aluminum oxide to aluminum up to this temperature. And beyond this temperature, it is the aluminum which will reduce which will reduce magnesium oxide to magnesium. And uh, the graph for carbon is coming down. It means that at sufficiently high temperature, carbon can cross any metal present in the Ellingham diagram. So carbon can reduce most of the metal oxides to metal and itself gets oxidized to carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide. We'll see later. So this is the description of Ellingham diagram. Uh, I'll separately draw uh, the graph for carbon and try to show you something important. Look at this graph, I would like to explain you use of carbon or carbon monoxide as a reducing agent in metallurgy with the help of this graph. Now what you see, what you realize is um, carbon can get oxidized in two ways. Carbon can become carbon dioxide or carbon can get oxidized to carbon monoxide. Now whether it becomes carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide, it all depends upon the delta G value uh, at that particular temperature. Look at this case, this is the graph. Uh, look at the equation first. Carbon solid is combining with oxygen gas and giving rise to carbon dioxide gas. So in this reaction what we see is one mole of gas is being consumed and one mole of gaseous product is being formed. So delta S for this reaction is close to zero. There is no almost no change in entropy of the system in this process. So the variation of delta G with temperature is negligible. It is almost zero. You can see you get a uh, horizontal line for uh, carbon dioxide formation from carbon because delta S is almost equal to zero. So delta G will not change with temperature. It is constant. But look at the case of carbon monoxide formation. For this is anyhow a solid, forget it. For one mole of gas which is being consumed, you are getting two moles of gaseous product. So delta S for this process is positive. Because delta S is positive, delta S is favoring uh, process to become spontaneous. So the graph is coming down. It is coming down. Why? Because delta S is positive. So with increase in temperature, delta G becomes increasingly negative. The process becomes more and more spontaneous. So at this particular temperature, say at this particular temperature, uh, formation of carbon dioxide is more favored than the formation of carbon monoxide because the graph pertaining to carbon dioxide is having more negative value than carbon monoxide formation. This happens up to this particular temperature. This corresponds to somewhere around 710 degrees Celsius, 710 degrees Celsius. Up to this temperature, carbon dioxide formation is favored and beyond this temperature, carbon monoxide formation takes place. Beyond 710, the species which can exist in majority is carbon monoxide because formation of carbon dioxide at, the, at a temperature above 710 will be less favored than the formation of carbon monoxide. If you are using coke as a coke plays double role, you know coke acts as a fuel, coke also acts as a reducing agent. So if you are using coke, then there is a possibility at a higher temperature that it gets transformed into carbon monoxide. Even carbon monoxide can act as a reducing agent. It itself gets oxidized to carbon dioxide. So the significant reducing agent which works at temperature above 710 is carbon monoxide. And uh, 
this oxygen comes from metal oxide. Now, instead of metal oxide, if we use metal sulfide, then the substance which is expected to form is CS. There is no such compound available. CS is not available. CS is, does not exist. So, that's the reason why metal sulfides are transformed into metal oxide and then they are subjected to reduction. So, it is more convenient to reduce metal oxides than metal sulfides as we don't have a, a compound uh, like CS as you have analogous compound CO. And because the graph is going down, that means it can cover even those metals which are initially below it in the Hellingham diagram because it is coming down. So, we need sufficiently high temperature. Imagine there is some metal like this. Oxide of this metal can be reduced by carbon monoxide at any temperature greater than this particular temperature. Say this is some temperature T dash. So, at a temperature greater than just greater than T dash, this metal oxide can be reduced by carbon monoxide. It can become uh, metal oxide to metal, it gets transformed. So, Ellingham diagram tells you exactly at what temperature a particular metal oxide can be reduced by coke. That is about uh, Ellingham diagram. It is a very powerful tool and it helps us to know at what particular temperature a particular reduction process can take place, uh, whether carbon will help at that particular temperature or not. Uh, such uh, ideas also you can get whether a particular active metal can be used to reduce a particular metal oxide at a particular temperature that type of decisions also you can make. The important statement you are supposed to know is a metal can reduce another metal oxide if it is present below it in the if the reducing metal is present below it below the metal whose oxide is to be reduced in the Ellingham diagram. In other words metal which is present below is more active and is capable of reducing metal oxide which is present above it. The topic we are now going to discuss is extractive metallurgy. Under this we will be discussing extraction of some important metals. Uh, before that, I would just uh, classify metallurgy and try to make it clear which metal falls in a particular category. Metallurgy, you can classify this into three categories. Hydrometallurgy, then you have pyrometallurgy. and you have electrometallurgy. In hydrometallurgy, we extract metal from aqueous solution by metal displacement reaction. We put more active metal and the less active metal comes out. Uh, here we have two important cases to discuss, silver and gold. These two metals we are going to extract by what is called as hydrometallurgy. You will learn about details about what is hydrometallurgy and how these metals are extracted in the next section. Then under pyrometallurgy we have two categories again, auto reduction and we have carbon reduction. In auto reduction, metal sulphide reduces its own oxide. If a sulphide of a metal reduces its own oxide, then you call it auto reduction. Here we will be talking about two cases, copper and lead. These two metals are extracted by what is called as auto reduction. Then you have carbon reduction. Here we either use carbon or carbon monoxide as a reducing agent. If carbon or carbon monoxide is responsible for reduction, it is described as carbon reduction. These two come under pyrometallurgy because we subject it to, we subject the ore to high temperature. Here we will be learning about extraction of zinc and, and tin. These three cases we are going to discuss under carbon reduction. Under electrometallurgy, we will be talking about magnesium and aluminum. So, we are going to discuss extraction of these metals under these categories one by one. 
we will start with hydrometallurgy. The two important metals which are extracted by this method are silver and gold. Extraction of silver. The important ore of silver from which silver is extracted is AG2S. It can be called as silver glance, silver sulphide. It is chemically silver sulphide called as silver glance. Let us see how silver is obtained from AG2S. The first step in the extraction is concentration of ore. Concentration of ore. This is done by frog flotation. Just remember, sulphide ores are generally concentrated by frog flotation technique. Here, we put powdered ore, water, and pine oil in a tank and we pass air, lots of air is passed and it is agitated. When you get froth and the ore particles will stick to the froth and the particles impurity that is gang or matrix settles down and uh, you recover the froth and allow it to collapse then oil flows down what is left out is particles of ore. So, that is froth flotation technique. So, Argent uh, silver glance is purified, is concentrated by froth flotation technique. Then the next step is leaching. Here the ore is treated with NaCN, sodium cyanide. Cyanide is a very important, very uh, powerful ligand. So, we blow air also then you get AgCN taken twice. This is a soluble complex plus Na2SO4. On cooling, this will crystallize and we get a soluble complex of silver, argentocyanide. Now, we uh, remove this by filtration. It is removed by filtration. Then, take the filtrate. The filtrate consists of this complex and react it with zinc. Zinc is an active metal. So, zinc will knock out silver and you, it will form ZnCn taken four times. It is a metal displacement reaction and you get Ag. This is how this is a metal displacement reaction. These two reactions take place in aqueous solution. That is why it falls under hydrometallurgy category. This is recovered by filtration. Now, the third step, refining. Refining of silver. Now, refining. Refining is done by electrolysis. Electrolytic refining is done. Here, anode is silver, that is impure silver. Impure silver acts as anode and cathode is pure silver. And the electrolyte is Electrolyte is AgNO3. Aqueous solution of silver nitrate acts as electrolyte. The impurities zinc, copper, gold. These are the impurities. Zinc will dissolve in the electrolyte as Zn2, whereas copper and gold they form anode mud. Copper and gold are, copper and gold will be in the anode mud. So, this is complete extraction of silver. Silver is extracted from silver glands, AG2S. The ore is first concentrated by froth flotation. It is then leached with NaCN. Leaching is done with NaCN. The role of oxygen of air is to oxidize sodium sulphide to sodium sulphate. 
sodium sulfide is oxidized to sodium sulfate so that on cooling it can separate out as crystals you get filtrate containing the silver complex then zinc is added which is being more active metal will displace silver and you get zinc complex in the filtrate and ag is formed ag is then refined method chosen is electrolytic refining we use anode as impure silver as anode and pure silver is used as cathode electrolyte is aqueous solution of agno3 uh, zinc impurity present in silver will dissolve in the electrolyte the copper gold will fall down as anode mud the next metal we are going to discuss the extraction of gold extraction of gold we know that gold is available in its native form in the auriferous rock uh, we take powdered auriferous rock take it in the powdered form and add nscn this is leaching again we take 0.2% of nscn and this consists of au pass air which will supply oxygen au present in the auriferous rock it consists of impurities right then nscn 0.2% solution of nscn is added air is blown into it and you get au cn twice and naoh solution becomes alkaline this is the first step the job of oxygen of air is to oxidize au from its zero oxidation state to plus one oxidation state here oxidation state of au is in the plus one state or s form so this job is done by aerial oxygen then this complex is treated with scrap zinc scrap zinc metal displacement reaction takes place and you end up with this zn cn taken four times to minus plus au these are the two steps again th these two reactions take place in aqueous solution that's the reason why it comes under the category hydrometallurgy the metal is obtained by displacement reaction in aqueous solution this is gold you obtain here the impurities are impurities present in the gold are zinc lead copper and silver these are the impurities present in the gold which is obtained now purification or refining refining of gold this is done in four stages because we have uh, four impurities four important impurities present in it so we do the refining in four stages number 1 dilute sulfuric acid is added this will remove zinc it removes zinc as zinc sulfate it dissolves zinc dissolves in dilute sulfuric acid whereas lead copper and silver they do not copper and silver are below hydrogen in the activity series lead is rendered passive by sulfuric acid the next step is cupellation here the metal is taken the impure metal is taken in a crucible and you blow lots of air in it and you heat it when you do that pb is removed removes pb as volatile oxide pbo we pass lots of air we blow lots of air and heat the metal pb is removed as volatile oxide then the third stage in the refining of gold is uh, for the removal of copper we we do this we heating with borax this will remove copper copper will be forming copper metaborate and it will be lost as volatile substance then finally heating with concentrated h2so4 this removes 
silver silver dissolves in it as ag2so4 silver is slightly soluble in sulfuric acid and uh, on heating it dissolves as ag2so4 and in this way you get rid of all the four impurities zinc uh, lead copper and silver zinc is red, uh, removed by adding dilute sulfuric acid once you remove zinc then you do cupellation that is heating the metal in lots of air uh, lead gets oxidized to volatile oxide it is removed then copper is removed by heating the metal with borax and finally silver is removed by heating in concentrated sulfuric acid so this is how gold is extracted and the process is described as hydrometallurgy the reason is gold is first transformed into a soluble complex and then you do metal displacement reaction by adding scrap zinc so these are the two examples which uh, are in hydrometallurgy well the next method uh, metal we are going to discuss is copper extraction of copper important ore of copper is cu fe s2 this is the chemical composition the name is copper pyrites also called as chalcopyrites this consists of cuprous sulfide and ferrous sulfide so you can realize that the ratio of copper and iron is 1 is to 1 so you have lots of iron as an impurity in the ore so we need several stages uh, of removal of iron uh, you cannot remove all the iron in one go well the first step involved in in this is concentration of ore concentration of ore and because it is a sulfide ore be concentrated by the technique froth flotation it's the same method we put uh, powdered ore in a tank we put lots of water we add pine oil and then we blow air and agitate the mixture froth is formed ore particles will stick to the froth and this is recovered and allowed to collapse and then oil separates out or particles are recovered this is concentration by froth flotation technique next step is roasting here the ore is heated in air as long as you know fe is more active fe is present above copper in the activity series fe is more active than copper so fe will get oxidized in preference to copper as long as fe s ferrous sulfide is available copper sulfide will not get a chance to get oxidized so you lose here we lose fe as fe sio3 and you lose moisture moisture is lost volatile impurities volatile impurities are lost some of the fe will be lost as fesio3 because this is associated with some sand uh, when you oxidize it uh, ferrous sulfide will become ferrous oxide this will react with sand present in it and it will be lost as fesio3 you still have lots of fes and cu2s in the mixture after roasting the next step is smelting smelting is done in blast furnace here what we do is we take the roasted ore you add coke coke will work as a fuel uh, you add sio2 and air hot air most of the fe will be removed as fesio3 slag and you still have CO2S. I told you, as long as FeS is present, uh, CO2S will not get oxidized to copper oxide. So you get rid of most of the Fe in this process, but you will not be able to oxidize copper sulfide. Even any small amount of copper sulfide becomes copper oxide. It again becomes copper sulfide by reacting with ferrous sulfide. As long as FeS, more active metal is available, Fe is available, copper will not get oxidized. So it is impossible. to oxidize cu2s in presence of fes when fes when fes and cu2s are present together you cannot oxidize this 
without oxidizing this. If it gets oxidized, then it will immediately get reduced by this exchange reaction takes place. The end result of smelting is called as matte. Matte consists of Cu2S and FeS. Uh, the amount of FeS present is less than what you had in the very beginning. This is matte. Now, the next step is Bessemerization. After smelting, we do what is called as Bessemerization. Here, we use Bessemer converter. This is the name of the furnace in which you do this Bessemerization. Here, we take matte, which consists of Cu2S and FES. Uh, fine sand, we blow air and we heat it. Then Fe will be lost as FeSiO3. This will appear as a green flame at the mouth of the Bessemer converter. This time you lose all the Fe as FeSiO3. After this, this will be burnt off. When the color of the flame or at the mouth of the converter changes, like it will be green flame because of FeSiO3. If the color changes, then you can assume that all the Fe has been lost. Now, uh, now cut the supply of sand and continue passing air and continue heating. Then what happens is some of the copper sulfide will get oxidized to copper oxide. Then you cut the supply of air and continue heating. Then what happens you know further transformation of copper sulfide to copper oxide will not take place but the reaction between copper sulfide and copper oxide starts taking place which you call it as auto reduction. So there are three stages in Bessemerization. The first stage is you heat matte with uh, in presence of fine sand and air. That is the first stage. You heat in presence of fine sand and air. Second stage is you cut the supply of sand and continue heating and passing air. And the third stage is stop passing air and continue heating. So when, when you are first passing sand, then FES will get oxidized to FeO. Next moment it becomes FeSiO3. And when you cut the supply of sand, this you do when you when the color of the flame at the mouth of the converter changes because it burns with a green flame as long as Fe is present. Then cut the supply of sand and then continue heating and passing air. This will oxidize some of the copper sulfide to copper oxide. Then sufficient amount of copper sulfide has been changed to copper oxide. Now cut the supply of air and continue heating. This time auto reduction takes place and you get copper. I will show you with the help of equation. Now look at the various now look at the various reactions which take place in the Bessemer converter. FeS reacts with oxygen, it becomes FeO, SO2 is lost. FeO then reacts with SiO2 that is sand and becomes FeSiO3. It is this substance which is burning at the mouth of the furnace with green flame. If the color changes, that means formation of this substance has been stopped. That means FES has been totally used up. Now, the next reaction which can take place when all the FES has been removed, then copper sulfide will get a chance to get oxidized. You get copper oxide and SO2. This again escapes out. When sufficient amount of copper oxide is formed, now look at this you will realize Cu2O reacts with left out Cu2S and you get copper plus SO2. Now I will try to this reaction is called as auto reduction I will try to balance it uh, take this two, uh, two moles two moles of this will react with one mole of this and you get uh, uh, six moles of this and one mole of SO2. That means you need to see to it that two-third of cuprous sulfide is oxidized 
and one third of Q plus sulphide is still left out, then two is to one reaction between these two will take place and you get metallic copper like this. It is not possible to exactly achieve this type of transformation, but you know you can always try. You, you have a method of you know recovering the sample from the furnace and analyzing it or when to stop passing air. This continues as long as you are passing air. At this stage you stop passing air and this reaction takes place. This is the actual auto reduction process which takes place. The copper which you get at the end of bessemerization, it is called as blister copper. blister copper then you we have so far we have talked about concentration is done by froth flotation then we have discussed about roasting that is the second stage third stage is smelting fourth stage is bessemerization and then the fifth stage is pulling here uh, molten metal molten metal that is copper is stirred with green wooden logs molten metal is stirred with green wooden poles so here the hydrocarbons present in the green wooden logs will uh, volatilize they reduce the left out copper oxide if any traces of copper oxide is present those are oxidized and due to stirring any volatile impurities are present those also will get a chance to escape out so pooling is a very old technique and it is uh, still being followed to some extent we have other methods also fine so here you can manage to uh, reduce left out copper oxide in the blister copper then finally you have electrolytic refining in electrolytic refining impure copper acts as anode pure copper acts as cathode and aqueous copper sulfate is the electrolyte aqueous copper sulfate acts as electrolyte impure copper is made anode and pure copper acts as cathode so on passing current uh, anodic oxidation takes place cu2 plus becomes cu becomes cu2 plus see this is the reaction taking place at anode cu becomes cu2 plus by losing two electrons anodic oxidation takes place and the reaction which takes place at cathode is Cu2 plus picks up two electrons and becomes Cu. So as you continue passing current mass of anode decreases and mass of cathode increases and all the impurities fall down as anode mud. Here uh, any zinc impurity present will dissolve in the electrolyte as zinc sulphate. The anode mud consists of silver and gold. Anode mud consists of silver and gold. Any traces of zinc present in the uh, metal will dissolve in the electrolyte. So that is how copper is extracted from its ore.